Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. Well, let's start with our news segment. Lots of good stuff in the news. The Washington Post listed the worst cities for allergies this year. Uh, and the first, the worst city is Wichita, Kansas. Dallas, of course, is number two, but you know, I think Dallas is the worst city. Uh, in the past, McCallum, Texas has been terrible. Oklahoma City and Richmond, Virginia, as well as San Antonio. But you know, this year it was Wichita, Kansas. The best cities, and this is why you don't want to choose where to go because of pollen count. <laughs> the, the best cities were Buffalo, Seattle, okay, and Cleveland. You know, I'm from Cleveland. I wouldn't go back there. No matter if the pollen count was zero, I'm not going back to Cleveland. Anyway, uh, China has opened its borders to foreigners. This has, you know, been closed for a long time. They're issuing visas again if you want to go to China. Uh, and even if you have a visa, you're welcome to go back. So they're no longer testing people. Uh, nationally, numbers look good for hospitalizations uh, and cases. So that's all really good. Test positivity is falling. And... Uh, Still a little bit disturbing is only 16.4% of the United States population has gotten a booster shot. So people, I don't know what you're thinking, but you can wait until the fall maybe. Last week I talked about the, uh, the, the number of cases per 100,000. So that's a better index of how many, you know, how, because the population is very, how many cases there are. But if you just look at absolute number of cases, this is a world map and you can see, you know, and this is at this point because it's low across the world, these, these case numbers are actually somewhat indicative of where they're hot spots. So India, Algeria, Libya, and Egypt, as well as South Africa uh, and Indonesia have, are having little increases. If you look at the trends on COVID cases, they're down, which is good. Hospitalizations continue to go down. And deaths, a lagging indicator, as I've said many times, is down to about uh, 1,700 deaths per week. Now, just think about that. I mean, we're saying that great. That's 88,000 over a year. So, you know, that's still twice the uh, mortality of flu. State of Texas is doing well. We're, this is the uh, risk map. It green is, means you have low uh, community transmission. This is a CDC map. And you can see our friends in Dominicana had zero cases last week, and, and Harris County had zero cases. More hospitalizations, but zero cases, that, at least they reported to the CDC. In the TMC, um, our positivity is below 5%, which is great. Our hospitalizations are down around 80 per day, and wastewater continues now to drop, so that's very, very good. And then I thought I'd pull out the United States wastewater data, because I think this is what we're going to see through the whole summer. Red means that the case, uh, case numbers or amount of virus in wastewater is doubled, so over 100%. Orange is between 50 and 100%, and you can see that about 20% of the wastewater sites in the United States are reporting increases in virus. And so rather than do it the usual way, I actually circled in red all the wastewater sites that are reporting up you know, twice as much in the orange are the ones, as I said, up to 100%. And you can see they're kind of all over the, all over the place, Maine, parts of California, uh, South Carolina, and then a lot in the Midwest. And so I think we're going to continue to see hot spots all over the country just emerging. You can tell with these wastewater numbers, these areas are going to have increase in case numbers over the next couple of weeks. So we're just going to be seeing this. Uh, the, the good news, and I've said this last week, but the good news is the predominant species, remember, the main variant is XBB 1.5, and that is, you know, still 90, over 90% 90 of the, of the uh, variants. There's not a new variant emerging. And just to remind you, this was a lineage that started in Singapore and it came out of the BA2 and B1.5 lineages that were mostly in the East. Now, the, the piece of news that I'm, I was actually surprised did not get much, much in the way of coverage in, in, the, in the national news, uh, it was mentioned a couple of times, but this to me was a big deal. Researchers at the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention uploaded some swabs of samples that were collected right after the beginning of the pandemic. So January of 2020. Remember, the first cases were late December. And this was from the Hunan open market. And they had swabbed uh, cases, uh, uh, cages, walls, and floors, and did gen genome sequencing. And what they found was that uh, the raccoon dogs that were being sold in cages there 
were positive for the, the Wuhan virus that was infecting people. Now, what, you know, I'm really surprised <laughs> that this was not covered. I guess it shows the politics, because this, again, gives more credence to the thought that it emerged as a spillover event. Raccoon dogs have been known to harbor other viruses that jump to humans, and in fact, in 2003, a virus very similar to SARS-CoV-1, um, which is sort of similar, was, was identified in Guangdong, China. So raccoon dogs have been vectors before, and this is what, <laughs> I know you're dying to, to know what a raccoon dog looks like. Creepy little animals, they're, you know, I guess they're no creepier than the pangolins, but that's what they look like. So here, this is fascinating to me. This, these are photographs taken in that very Hunan market that we think is the epicenter of the pandemic in October of 2014, well before the pandemic. And these were just people who had taken some pictures inside there. And this little guy right here is a raccoon dog, illegally being traded, a live raccoon dog in 2014. So these things are present, also identified in, 2019, in 2020. So you'll recall a paper I had gone over uh, in the past, it was about uh, early in 2022, was a, a geospatial analysis of, some, of many different uh, scientists from Europe and the United States and China. And they did geospatial mapping of all of the people, the early cases that were reported in WHO. And you can see that they really clustered. This is the yellow ones are identified as primary cases. They clustered around the Hunan market and then these green dots are uh, community transmission. So they got in contact with people who were infected from the, from the marketplace. That data strongly suggested that the epicenter was the Hunan market. So I don't know why people didn't get all excited about this because the Congress is starting a, you know, a big commission on the origin of the virus. Uh, the president's declassifying data so you can find out what you know, the Department of Energy was thinking. But that's pretty compelling evidence that the that raccoon dogs were infected right there and are capable of, or, or at least they're, they were infected at the time of the beginning of the, of the pandemic. Now, if you're a believer in it was a, a, a lab accident, then you have to say somebody in the lab somehow got over the Hunan market and infected caged raccoon dogs because they were infected at the time. It's not saying it's impossible, it's just saying, you know, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And so it seems more likely that the start of the origin was the pangolin, uh, sorry, started with the bat, probably the next required the pangolin virus, um, the pangolin uh, spike protein, and that the intermediary species was likely the raccoon dog. At least they were infected at the time, right at the time of the start of the market, you know, the start of the pandemic. So to me, one more piece of evidence that strongly suggests that this was a spillover event from illegally marketing uh, these dogs. And, and this, is, this is similar to what's happened in the past. The only <laughs> little remnant uh, for people who think it's a conspiracy theory is that there's this one particular site on the spike protein called the furin, furin cleavage site that's required for cell-to-cell uh, -cell fusion, for, for the virus to fuse to cells. We do not know where that came from. It's not clear where that was acquired and it was very necessary. So what we would need to do is, you know, find a bunch of animals in the wild, probably focus on raccoon dogs and the deer and other animals we know are very infectable, and see whether or not you could identify that one piece of sequence that, you, that is there. Otherwise, it seems to me pretty clear is the spillover event. And again, I don't understand. I got almost no coverage. I mean, really, almost no coverage. Uh, okay, then the other great, my favorite story of the week, I, I, I love New York, and you know, we, I hate to say it, but we lived in New York, I raised my children there, I had a place to live at Brownstone, and we had rats. Every now and then rats would come in. Well, only in New York <laughs> would they collect rats and sequence, look for coronavirus, but they did. Uh, they got 79 rats in New York City in the fall of 2021, and here's... 16.5%, 13 of the 79 rats tested po positive for, for coronavirus. So they then, the investigators then uh, took a relative, the albino relative, which we use in the lab all the time, the Sprague Dolly rat, which is an albino Norway rat, and tried to infect them. And it turns out they're easily infectable. 
uh, what, you know, so don't everyone get scared when you see a rat because we don't know rats can transmit to humans. But one thing we know is they can get infected with, uh, with coronaviruses. Anyway, <laughs> Janet, don't be worried. <laughs> The rats are coming to get you. All uh, righty. Um, anyway, I uh, want to end today with some shout-outs. The first thing, of course, the holy season of Ramadan begins this week with Moonrise and will last for 30 days. Uh, and then a big day last week, match day, uh, we had for our fourth-year medical students. Our students did great. Uh, more than half are going to begin their uh, residencies in primary care, and 48 will continue training at Baylor. Uh, and, of course, we also matched, so we brought in 310 new trainees, uh, residents and fellows who will be joining our program. Another uh, giant shout out is to the Axiom X2 mission. This is a private uh, astronaut mission that's going to send some astronauts to the International Space Station in the spring. Uh, we are doing one of the really cool uh, scientific projects. Uh, our uh, Genome Center under the direction of Richard Gibbs is going to be doing uh, genomic sequencing before and after weightlessness. So that's kind of cool. We'll see how that goes. And of course, <laughs> it was spring break in Dimmick County. And uh, the Carrizo uh, Springs High School's Mean Purple Band earned a chance to go to the state competition. I'm very proud of them. Congratulations, MPB, Mean Purple Band. And of course, the track team also did very well, the junior high track team. We're very excited about them. And finally, I want to thank Chris Powell and Queenie uh, from California. They sent uh, a nice uh, St. Patrick's card uh, to Lily. They, <laughs> they included a little greeting to me but we know it's for Lily. So thank you so much for the card. Can't wait to see you all next week.